You're listening to sermons from Southbridge Fellowship in Raleigh, North Carolina. We pray that today's message helps you to connect to Jesus for life change. I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit today. It would be a tragedy for us to talk about the Holy Spirit and uh, not to invite the Holy Spirit to come to a work. So let's talk to him. Father, we come before you as our Father in the name of your Son, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I ask your Holy Spirit to move and to work in our lives, in this church, in this room, online. Um, use us. And uh, I pray for the things that I'll say. You know, it might be different than the last service. And you know the conversations you want to have. You know the things that you want said. Will you filter out stuff you don't want me to say and maybe put new thoughts in my head in areas where that's needed. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I hate to wait. Doesn't matter if it's in line, in traffic, on hold. No, I don't want you to call me back in three days. I will wait because I think that that's quicker, not because I like to wait. I hate to wait. I did a little reading this week, and they've done studies to see how much we wait on average. And if you go to the doctor, on average, you'll wait 32 minutes. And so you can judge your doctor whether they're better or worse than average. TSA, uh, when we're at the airport, about 28 minutes in line. You can elbow your spouse with this next one, because I don't know which one it is, a uh, husband or wife, but spouses typically wait for the other one to get ready about 21 minutes each time they're supposed to go somewhere. Uh, somebody is doing better than average over here. <laughs> on hold, uh, for customer service, on average, 13 hours annually. In traffic, obviously this depends on the city, uh, 38 hours uh, in traffic. This shakes out that in line we wait uh, in our lifetimes about six months. So six months of our lives waiting in line. I had to wait in line at the self-checkout at Walmart the other day. You've been to Walmart, they've got like nine million aisles, no one's ever manning any of them. Then the self-checkout, I haven't even been trained for this, there's a bunch of them, and there was only one opened. I got to know the guy next to me because we were standing there for so long. He owned a business. Uh, we were talking about life. And I said, are they understaffed? And he goes, I don't know. I was like, we're the staff. I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, so. <clears throat> All right. Sorry, that was a divergence. 43 days. Uh, 43 days on hold with customer service in our lives. Think about that. Over a month on hold. I think I've done that in a couple months before. Any anyway, rate, <laughs> I don't know about you. Maybe you like to wait. Does anyone here like to wait? Is there anyone who intentionally picks the longest line wherever they go? Okay, no, so kind of, kind of. All right, there's a couple. Oh, it's strange. I love you. Fruit of the Spirit, I don't have yet. Any anyway, rate, let me ask you this. What are you waiting for in life? We start life nine months in the womb. We start waiting. <laughs> Some people are waiting for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Maybe you're waiting for a letter from that college you want to get into, waiting for test scores, waiting for the doctor to call, waiting for a good break, waiting for circumstances to change, waiting for... What are you waiting for? Many of you know that this past year I had some struggles with health, and by God's grace, thank you for so many of your prayers. I'm doing uh, much better, not 100%, but about 80%. But uh, around August last year, I started having problems. I didn't even know what they were or where they came from. I was in and out of the hospital three times total. Uh, the first time uh, that I went to the hospital, they knew that I had uh, diverticulitis and some other complications internally. But they didn't know what all of them were. And so my primary care doctor just started ordering a bunch of tests. He wanted me to get an abdominal scan and do a sleep study and ear, nose, and throat doctor and like all kinds of different things. And that was scheduled throughout a couple months. And so on my birthday, October 19th, go ahead and write that down for next year, <laughs> October 19th, on October 19th, I had an abdominal scan, and throughout this time period, I'm like, good days, bad days, and October 19th was my birthday, I was like, I'm having a good day. I ran that morning and lifted weights and was feeling great and went and had this abdominal scan. About an hour later, I'm at Walmart. Again, there's a theme in my life. You see this? I'm at Walmart. <laughs> Walking around. And a uh, cell phone rings. It's my primary care doctor. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. He's just calling me because <laughs> he wasn't part of the scan. He says, where are you at? I didn't want him to judge me, so I didn't say where. But I said, I'm shopping. <laughs> you can assume Target if you'd like. That is not where I go. But anyway, I said, I'm shopping. And so <clears throat> he says, well, how far are you from where you got the scan? I was like, not very far. He goes, I need you to go there 
get the disc that has the scan on it and then take that to the emergency room. I'm like, I'm not a courier. Like, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go to the emergency room. He goes, you need to go to the emergency room. You're leaking poison into your system right now. I said, yeah, I'm not going. And he's looked at me like some of you just did, huh? Uh, he said, what do, you, what do you mean? You're not going. And I said, well, if I go to the emergency room, I'm just going to have to wait for like three to six hours. People will be coughing on me. It's my birthday. Like, I'm going to go have food with my family. I'm not doing that. Like, so I'm going to sit there and at some point wonder, would it have been better had I gotten shot? Because that guy just got rushed past me. Like, this is terrible. I hate to wait. He tried to convince me to go to the emergency room. I did not go. I said, well, if I had had the scan tomorrow, I feel fine today. The scan was tomorrow. Then tomorrow you'd tell me to go. I'll go tomorrow. <laughs> he called in some extra medicine for me, and I went the next day, drove myself to the emergency room, and there's a theme in that, those of you who have been around our church. And, and then uh, when I get there, the long story short is the reason why I was there was I was supposed to see a specialist, and I couldn't get an appointment with a specialist for two weeks, and so going this route, they said, would get me to her faster. And so it's a Friday. She wasn't there on the weekend. Uh, long story short, and I won't tell you all the details of that, maybe some other time, it was a terrible weekend at the hospital. Uh, multiple, you know, care plan change, it was no food, then crappy food, then you can have any food, but all their food's kind of crappy, and then it was kind of like that whole deal, and then they switch it back, and then they confused, and doctor's not reading charts, my room flooded, like it was a nightmare, and so, but I'm just like, gotta make it through to Monday, make it through to Monday, see the specialist, Monday comes. <laughs> lady comes in. I left her a note that I was tired of sitting in the flooded room, so I was down in the lobby. She said, I couldn't read it because you have bad handwriting. <laughs> I looked at her. I said, yeah, I have a doctorate too, and so you probably have bad handwriting also. I'm like, I'm not your snarkiness. I can out snarky your snarky. And there, so here we go. And so then uh, I said, I'm waiting to see the specialist. She goes, oh, she probably won't be until Wednesday or Thursday. I was like, no, I'm not waiting longer. So I went to, didn't plan it at the time, but ironic now that I look back at it, a waiting room. <laughs> to make a private call to another hospital and said, I'm having crappy service here. Can I see your specialist? They said, tomorrow at 12 or 2. 12, because I don't want to wait. I hate to wait. What about you? What are you waiting for? I've got great news for you today. If you're a follower of Jesus and you want to know what's next for your life, the wait is over. The time is now. Because the Holy Spirit is here. Amen? If you got your Bibles, Acts chapter 2, we're going to be looking at specifically the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. We'll be back in Acts chapter 2, Lord willing, uh, next week as well. But what's happening here is, remember, uh, Luke, the guy who writes the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which ironically that book's not about Luke, but it's titled Luke, it's about Jesus. The life and work of Jesus, that he's fully God, fully man, came he brings good news of great joy. It'll be for all the people. He's a Savior, Christ, the Lord. And he can be your Savior, your Christ, your Lord, when you receive him. Luke wrote down all these things so that people would know the ministry of Jesus and what he did, and we could be certain about the things he said and the things that he did. And at the end of the book of Luke, Jesus, who's the star of the story, is murdered. And then he raises from the dead. He is risen. But then what happens next? And it's like between Luke and Acts, buffering our next episode, you know, the Bart's movie, before you start seeing these things, and to be continued. Remember, it's a handing off of the baton. I give an illustration of a, a, a relay race. It'd be like this. It'd be like, since today's Super Bowl Sunday, so you got my friend here grieving with his Eagles jersey on. They will not be playing today. I should have worn my Lions jersey. They will not be playing today either. Bad call. Bad. It was because of the refs. We'll get it. The Cowboys. But we got a picture of some seats at the Super Bowl. Here we go. I saw this on Instagram. For $700,000, you could either help us expand our children's ministry or sit here. <laughs> kind of kidding. Uh, you could sit here at the Super Bowl. Can you imagine that you get those seats? Maybe you win them so you didn't spend the money on them. Somebody gives those to you. You're sitting there, and you're watching the San Francisco 49ers play the Kansas City Swifts. And uh, the Kansas City <laughs> Swifts, they... And Patrick Mahomes, he's throwing bombs. He, Travis Kelsey catches a bomb and he hands you, you're sitting in that seat right there, boom. And he hands you the football afterwards. He's dancing, doing his thing. They, you know, girls are all excited and throwing things. And then he gets hurt. Taylor Swift's crying. 
Girls all across the nation are crying. They don't know what to do. Ratings go, you know, it's all over. And Patrick Mahomes gets hurt. And the backup, who's that even? Backup gets hurt. So Andy Reid comes walking over. You remember when he coached the Eagles? He comes walking over, and you're sitting there in that seat. Hands you the ball. He's like, you're up. You'd be like, ah. Uh, I mean, I could critique this. <laughs> I could tell when he made a bad decision. But the guys on the other side are 275 pounds. They run a 4 5, 40, and they want to kill me. I'm not doing that. Can you imagine how the disciples felt when Jesus has been back for 40 days? And he goes, hey, I'm leaving. <laughs> and you're up. He taught them, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. What's a church? Ecclesia, the called out ones. You're the called out ones. You're going to do greater works than I've ever done. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus said to them, and you're up. <gasps> what would you feel? But they had one job. Do you remember the job? Wait. Acts chapter 1, I'll read it to you to give us the context of chapter 2. On one occasion, so Luke's writing this uh, account about what Jesus said to his disciples. He says, on one occasion, while he was eating, Jesus was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Now, if you want to know what he's talking about, read on your own, we don't have time today, John chapter 16, 14 through 16 where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to bring to mind truth. He's going to remind you of the truth. He'll be your helper, a comforter, a counselor. He talks a lot about the Holy Spirit as he's preparing them hours before his death. When they don't have the Holy Spirit, they've got one job. It's to, okay, wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Remember what happens next? They're like, well, well, let's talk about politics. Are you going to make Israel great again? And then do that. All right, what about dates and times? And Jesus is like, don't hey, worry about that. Father's got that. Here's what you need to know. He said to them, verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or the dates, but instead, what are you supposed to do in the meantime? Okay, and then when the Holy Spirit comes, what's going to happen? For the Father is sent by his own authority, but you, but here's what you do need to know. You want to know about times and dates. You want to know about politics. I got a bigger vision than just this nation. And I got a plan for you before the times and dates, but you will receive power, that's what you're waiting for, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, different places, different types of people, different types of relationships, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Before that happens, one job, and you guys got it. Yeah, there's one of them that doesn't wait. We'll talk about that in just a minute. <laughs> what are they waiting for? Holy Spirit. All right. So get this picture in your mind before I read this next part. Mary's there. Mary, the mother of Jesus. 120 faithful followers of Jesus. And so by American standards, our church is doing better than the church that Jesus had started. Because we measure by attendance. Which is a terrible way to measure, by the way. There's 120 of them. There's 120. Okay. We got more than that in this room for sure. 120. So imagine them. They're in this upper room. And they're doing What? All right, well, the wait's over in chapter 2. Look at this. When the day of Pentecost came, that is uh, about 10 days after what happened in chapter 1, Jesus crucified at the Passover about seven weeks later. This takes place, 50 days. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound. So there's an audible sign, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. There was a house for 120 people, a big house. They saw what seemed to be, they saw, okay, so they heard, audible sign, saw, visible sign. They saw what seemed to be. This is the best that Luke can do to describe what he's been given and the reports he's received as he's writing this orderly account. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each one of them, all 120. All of them were, and you underline this, filled. Filled means to be influenced by, to be controlled by. They were under the power of the Holy Spirit. Kind of like you've heard maybe that person was filled with rage. The Bible compares being filled with the Spirit with being filled with alcohol. Filled with jealousy, or maybe uh, give a positive one, filled with compassion. 
It means those things are controlling. They're influencing you. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. As the Spirit enabled, key word, and so filled and enabled, key words there. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Remember where the gospel is going to go? To the uttermost parts of the world. But there's people from every nation right here. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Because each one heard in their own language being spoken. So hold up. This is different than 1 Corinthians 12 where there's ecstatic languages of tongues. This is a known language, but it wasn't known by the speaker. Look what it says next. They were utterly amazed and asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? They don't know our dialect. Then how is it, verse 8, that each of us hears them in our native language? And then I think God listed these to make fun of me as I was preaching. Uh, hard to read. Uh, Parthenians, Medes, Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia. <laughs> you couldn't say it either, Luke. He said residents. Anyway, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. Phyragia, Phyragia. Yep, I've heard both. Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God. There's 120 of them. They're declaring in their native tongues. These Galileans are saying to the native tongues of the other people, people from Rome and Arabs and Cretans, all these different people, they were somewhere amazed and perplexed and asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they had too much to drink, too much wine. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Peter's about to tell them. This is the beginning of a movement. I will argue the, and even if you take away all the spiritual, the greatest movement in human history, the church. Think about that, the enlightenment, changing the way we think. Postmodernism, the civil rights movement, scientific movement, the information age, you start thinking about the different movements that have taken place. Yeah, I would say the church has had the greatest impact. Society, cultures, ethics, morals, education, innovators of education, the church has always been. I talked last week about some of the bad things about the church, the crusades, selling of indulgences, Forced conversions. Today we've got consumerism, uh, celebrity pastors, uh, people making it overly political, fighting woke wars rather than spiritual battles. We'll choose gimmicks and marketing plans over prayer meeting. We, we do all this nonsense stuff in the name of Jesus, and it's clear to Jesus followers and the non Jesus followers that ain't Jesus. But there's good. Universities like Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard all started by Christians or as Christian universities, innovators in the educational system, hospitals, Johns Hopkins Hospital, some of the greatest hospitals in the world started by the church. Just think about how many hospitals in their full name, sometimes they don't say them now, Baptist Hospital, Methodist Hospital, different hospitals that are out there. Uh, there's always been something that you could kind of say was a hospital in most societies, places where sick people would come to, but it was really in the monasteries where nuns and monks would allow foreigners and strangers to come. They'd show hospitality, but also sick people would come for care. It's the beginning of hospitals and hospital innovation. Ethics, the golden rule, whether you're a Christian or not, and believe the Bible or not, treat others like you want to be treated. So the church has influenced society in ways, even if you take away salvation, miraculous healings, deliverance, transformation of relationship, take the spiritual out, but then if you add that in too, how many people have become a part of this movement thousands of years later? Today, on this planet, the population is about 8 billion people. About 2.3 billion of them profess faith in Christ. I'm not saying they're all believers. But that's a lot of people. Just in today, not counting throughout history, today. And I'm going to call the church in this series an unstoppable movement because of what Jesus said about it. The gates of hell will not prevail, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, against the church. Huh. And so only one point today, to this point. The unstoppable movement of God is supernatural. And what we're talking about is the supernatural today when we talk about the Holy Spirit. The unstoppable movement of God, the church, the called out ones, the ecclesia, is supernatural. 
But is it really unstoppable? Like, you got to ask yourself that question. Like, I can say that. That's fine. Uh, he can talk, do his thing, whatever. Let's go get lunch. Here's the deal. When you start looking at the church in America, you could argue it's being stopped. Or we're even stopped. Most of our problems are self-inflicted. So we're stopping ourselves. The gates of hell will not prevail, but maybe we can stop it. <laughs> oh. Here's some statistics on the church in America. Um, there's been some different studies done. Um, many of, some of you are even here because of what recently happened in the United Methodist Church. And they're splitting over what to do with the LGBTQ plus movement that's taking place. And it's not just an argument over whether to condemn people or whether to be kind and compassionate to people. The people Jesus said in his own ministry, I didn't come to condemn, you're under condemnation already. You come to save and rescue and we don't really need to debate those things, but when you want to start putting in leadership people that are propagating, promoting, and pushing things that are clearly contrary to God, that's a problem. The size of churches has changed significantly. A 2020 survey found that the average congregation size across all Christian denominations is less than half of what it was in the year 2000. So 20 years, here's what it, it was, 137. That was the average size in, 20, in the year 2000. Now it's 65. Congregations are getting older. On average, a third of churchgoers are 65 or older. If you're 65 or older, we love you. That's great. But they're, we're saying that it's not being replenished with new younger faces. And I've shared with you stats already about the genera next generation leaving and knowns and lack of spiritual interest in general. Um, here's a survey from Lifeway Research in 2019. And so they haven't done another one since COVID. This is 2019. I'm positive the numbers are worse now. They said that in 2019, 3,000 Protestant churches were started in the United States. Okay, jot that down if you're a math person. 4,500 closed. Which number is bigger? 4,500. I've heard that was the first time since they've been doing these surveys that the amount of closures exceeded openings. That's not a positive stat. That was before covid and churches closing down, sometimes because of poor leadership, sometimes because of conflict within, sometimes because of financial reasons. I'm positive the numbers are greater now. But Jesus said the gates of hell wouldn't prevail again. But it seems like we're losing ground. And, but remember, Jesus is talking about the church that he built. I think there's a lot of churches in America that we build. Because if you get a decent band and a speaker who can speak in complete senses, doesn't, you know, pee on himself in front of a crowd, like, just decent. You can gather people together. We're not talking about Taylor swift size crowds. We're talking like a couple thousand people. Decent salesperson, good enough strategy, figure out the parking lot a little bit. That's in our strength. We can do that. Think about in your own life. What do you do in your own strength? Do you even need the Holy Spirit? Let's be honest. Most of us don't even need the Holy Spirit. We know the Bible says, John chapter 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And most of us are like, yeah, yeah, we can. But you can't do anything that matters for eternity. You need supernatural empowerment. So why would we even try? And that's what's happening in this passage is they're receiving this supernatural empowerment to be this unstoppable movement. Don't forget, though, Acts chapter 2, as we talk about a vision a vision for the future. That Acts chapter 2 is not the vision for the future. This is the foundation from the beginning. This is looking to the past. And we're not trying to just make the church great again like it was back in the day. The vision's greater than what we see in Acts chapter 2. Think about what a vision is. We talked about it last week. JFK and MLK and Abe Lincoln and all those different... Uh, Apple, I talked to you about that. But remember, it's a picture of the preferred future. And I know 65% of people are visual learners. And so it'd be like this. If you went to our church website and you saw our pastors, uh, which if you go to the staff and leadership section, there'll be pictures like these pictures are actually taken from our church website. There you go. What will we look like in the future, I wondered. And so I asked our tech guys to do that for us and they give us that. <laughs> I said, whoa, 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 but I want to illustrate preferred future. Can you make me something for that? So we've got this here. Boom. <laughs> I guess I'll be a chef. I don't know. Post Malone will be leading worship. <laughs> DJ has, maybe the goggle price will go down. Pastor John, those arms, wow. That is something. <laughs> he man, he's got going there. And so, see, a vision always starts with a problem. And there's a plan, 
then a preferred future. If you want a vision for the church, look what the Apostle John says. In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, he says this. This is the future. He gives us a glimpse into heaven. He says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. There's no number for this. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before, and Jesus is the Lamb. And they're singing, and they're excited, and the Spirit's moving. It's supernatural what's taking place. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit. It starts in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. All of them were filled under the influence, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus gave them the command, wait, they have one job, right? Wait, there's one guy who doesn't wait. Anybody want to guess who it is? It's not Philip. Remember Philip's the guy that when they, he talks about, how are we going to feed 5,000 people? And Philip's a nerd. Like he tries to calculate it. Pulls his abacus out and gets the thing going. Half a year's wages. We wouldn't have enough to give everybody one bite. You know, this kind of thing. He's just there and... It's not Philip. He's over there still trying to count. How are we going to get from Jerusalem to Judea? You know, he's doing his thing over there. One job. What is it? But Peter stands up. All right, we got to replace Judas. (laughs) I don't think that Peter was studying the book of Joel during those 10 days. I don't know that. The Bible doesn't say. But he's the only, he's a man of action. And he's getting his mouth before his brain. I can identify with Peter. And so Peter Starts going. Sometimes I get home from church and my wife's like, I can't believe you said that. I was like, I said that? Oh, oop, oop. <laughs> Peter gets up and he's like, let's replace him. And he replaces him with a guy, Matthias, who we never hear about in the Bible again or in history again. So some people say that was a mistake. We don't know. The Bible doesn't clearly say. And then later, there's a guy named Saul who becomes Paul and he says, I'm an apostle, but not one naturally born. Because he didn't walk with Jesus like the other guys did before. Instead, he was trying to kill followers of Jesus and imprison them. But the Holy Spirit struck him as he was in the process of doing that. And God spoke to him. And then he gave tragedy into his life as he was blinded. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, his eyes were opened. And many of us need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes. As we talk about the Holy Spirit before he even give us some of the, the things that he empowers us for, I recognize that we all have different backgrounds and When I say Holy Spirit, some of you get scared. Some of you are excited. It's like it's about time we're getting to the good stuff. Some of you, charismatic maybe. There we go. (laughs) At least want to be. You're in the back, so maybe you're a Baptist who wants to be a charismatic. I don't know. (laughs) Love you. We got all kinds of different backgrounds. Last week, uh, I was talking to staff members, and we had about 17, 18 staff members, and uh, we do on a weekly basis just get together and how are we seeing God work? What's he doing in our church? It doesn't have to be on a Sunday. It can be on a Tuesday. Like whatever's going on. And so we're talking and one of them um, says that she's got a relative. She's been wanting to come to a small group with her for a long time and finally came and then afterwards her relative's Catholic said, is that a group for recovering Catholics? Oh my. So some of you, that's your background. Some of you are Baptists and Methodists and different things. Some of you are hoping it's like, oh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, but please tell me he doesn't do anything today. That's right. Some of your backgrounds taught that. That's what my background taught me when I first became a Christian. The Holy Spirit did a bunch of cool stuff in the Bible. He doesn't do that anymore. It's like, wah, wah, wah. here's the deal. Uh, there are times in life where there's people you love and they're influential in your life, but what they say contradicts the Bible. If that's true, go with the Bible. You can still love those people, but go with the Bible. And so the Bible doesn't say that any of these gifts have stopped. The Bible doesn't say that. People that mess with verses, and we don't have time to get into all that today, but it doesn't say that. Just say, where does it say that? It doesn't say that. What you're saying is not what that says. So what does it say? Well, it says the Holy Spirit is not the third string quarterback of the Trinity, by the way. Not some mystical force. Not God's manifestation of himself today, but he wasn't, but at one time he was the Father, and now he's the Son, and then now he's the, no, no, that's not how we're, the Trinity is that God is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all co-eternal, all existing always, always true. The Holy Spirit, and don't just take this from my word for it, has been from the beginning, and it's not, you don't get to pick his pronoun, it's a he, not it, He. Genesis 1.26, the creation accounts, the beginning of the Bible, God's creating and God said, let us, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image. David, one of my favorite psalms, says in Psalm 139, 
gives a divine characteristic to the Holy Spirit. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. We read in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, there are things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same one way, no one knows the thoughts of God except by the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of God. We have a relationship. How is your relationship? Do you trust? How are you relating with the Holy Spirit, because you can grieve the Holy Spirit with your sin. That's in Ephesians chapter 5, I believe it's verse 18. Uh, You can lie to the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 5, if you keep going in the book of Acts, when Peter is leading in the church, and there's this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they give a big gift to the church, and then they could have just given the gift, and it was a huge blessing, but then they lied and said it was everything from the sale, something they had sold, and he said, why'd you lie to the Holy Spirit? And then they died. Whoa, that's supernatural. And probably why at the end of the book, or at the end of chapter 5, there's people that are hesitant, don't want, they're amazed at what's happening in the church, but they don't want to join. Now today, like if after the service, you're like, I'm new to the church, and I'm interested in being a member, you go to the next steps classes, or there's like a pastor meet and greet, and I meet you, and people ask like, well, what, do I, what happens if I become a member? And what people want to know is, what do I get? Special privileges? Is there like extra teaching? Like, is there other resources? Can I lead the handbell choir? We don't have that. <laughs> if I say we're not going to have it, then the Holy Spirit will be like, <laughs> watch this. That's why I won't do that. <clears throat> um, what, what is the extra benefit? Because we treat it like it's a subscription or a gym membership or a country club membership. No, being a member, join, what they didn't want to join is I don't want to join part of that movement, identify with those people, live as family with them, be held accountable with one another, because I might get killed. Now we get extra benefits, and so that's a problem in the church. Maybe we should change it. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't call it membership. I don't know what we call it, but um, you look here, and, and you see that the Holy Spirit's personal, the Holy Spirit's divine, the Holy Spirit is a he and he does a lot of stuff. We don't have time to cover all of it today. Counsels, comforts, convict, the whole world convicts of sin. Is the only way that you are saved, Titus 3, 5, gives new life, redemption, uh, guides us to truth, is the author of Scripture, 2 Peter chapter 2. But today we're talking about he's, he empowers us. That's our source of power is the Holy Spirit. You will receive power, Acts 1 a, when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Okay, and that's what's happening in chapter 2. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, let's be honest, we don't, for most of what we do in the church, don't need the Holy Spirit. We don't need the Holy Spirit to gather. We don't need the Holy Spirit to teach. We don't need it for a social. We don't need it for a lot of stuff. A.W. Tozer said it like this, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what we're doing in our churches would go right on and nobody would know the difference. I do not believe in a repetition of Pentecost, he goes on to say, but I do believe in perpetuation. The power continues. Acts 1 8, you will receive power. We don't need the Holy Spirit to put together a little company with a Jesus title on the front of it and run it like a business and say Jesus stuff. But for lives to be changed, for real transformation, for healings, for marriages to be reconciled, for salvation, this is supernatural. So what does he empower? We see in this passage, he empowers super, there's about five things that I'm going to mention. I will not preach them all like they're a full point here for the sake of time, but supernatural risk. Think about what Peter does here. There are two responses to them having these audible wind comes into the house, visible fire on their heads. Then they're speaking in languages they haven't been trained to speak. Is that the sign that you are filled with the Holy Spirit? It's a sign. Now, if you read 1 Corinthians 12, we read that not everyone has that gift. It is a gift. It does continue. But there are other signs, and I encourage you on your own, read the book of Acts and just underline every time it says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and, and what? So the next thing is a sign. And spoke boldly, and filled with joy, and prayed, and... Okay, look at that when you go through here, because that's, those are signs. 
Oops, don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. They're filled with the Spirit. And it said, remember I read this to you already, some of them were wondering, verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them. They had too much to drink. Okay, so some are curious, some are judgmental. I would challenge you with the famous soccer coach, Ted Lasso, be curious, not judgmental. You can look up his team too. Maybe you get tickets to one of the games. In the midst of the mockery, Peter steps up and starts preaching from the book of Joel. Huh. 3,000 people are saved that day, not just by the results. But you might say, well, that's natural for Peter. Like when, Pete, when, when the message of the church or evangelicalism or somehow something you identify with is being mocked, what is natural for you to do? It's natural to deny association or that's not part, at least not that part. Oh, I agree with you. That's not what Peter does. Peter stands up and says, you guys killed Jesus. You got frozen from the dead. And he preaches about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit from the prophet Joel. And he preaches about what David says. And he says, but, but Jesus is greater than David. And he was resurrected from the dead. And God, he's the Christ. You're talking about my Lord. That's supernatural. Say, well, well but Peter's always stepping up and talking, even when he's not supposed to. That's right. And sometimes it's natural. Sometimes it's supernatural. This is supernatural. How do we know? We don't have time to unpack this either, but... In 1 Corinthians, we're told about the natural person. What we naturally do, we don't discern spiritual things naturally. That's a supernatural work. Doesn't mean we can't learn information. We can't really know God. It says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, so you know I'm not making this up. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person, so here's what the natural person is like, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them. He's incapable. It's impossible apart from a supernatural work because they're spiritually discerned. Okay, so look at Peter, and we see him throughout the Gospels, and he's oftentimes saying stuff he shouldn't be saying, but sometimes he says stuff supernaturally. I quoted to you Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 already, the gates of hell will not, on this rock, Peter, I'll build my church, but the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, in that chapter as well, there's an encounter that Jesus has with the disciples where Jesus is walking with them. They go into Caesarea Philippi. If you've ever been there, some of you have traveled with me and my wife to Israel, and you go, it's a beautiful place, but what it's known for is awful. It's a place of tremendous idolatry. There's a big cave, and there's water flowing into the cave, and there would be unspeakable sacrifices thrown into that water, people doing things I couldn't say uh, from this pulpit to animals out there, outside of it. And if I took a group of guys there and was like, oh, I'm mentoring them, it's good, you guys would be like, you can't be my pastor anymore because I'm canceling you. Like, I don't want you going to those places. Jesus took his guys there. And that's where he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Huh. Interesting. Earlier, he asked them this question. Who do people say that I am? I mean, what are the stats on me? What are the poll, the opinion polls? Oh, am I going to get elected? What's going on? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Some say John the Baptist. Some say, who do you say that I am? And Peter, spokesperson for the group. You're the one that's been promised for thousands of years that's going to rescue us from our sins, deliver us. He says it succinctly, but he says, you are the Christ. And Jesus says, that's supernatural. That's from God. Two minutes later, Jesus is telling them he's going to die. He's going to be killed, handed over to the chief priest, teacher of the law, the elders. Peter goes, no, 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 not you. He goes, get behind me, Satan. Hold up. I just spoke from the Father. (laughs) Now, see, you can be walking in the Spirit one moment and not walking in the Spirit the next. And in that one passage, we see the supernatural and the natural. Here, it's supernatural because he's discerning the things that have been taught in the Old Testament that these people didn't understand because the Holy Spirit had stirred in them. And what happens is he takes a supernatural risk. Risk is the language we use at our church when we talk about faith because we don't know what's going to happen when we do it. God may because he knows everything, the end from the beginning. He knows it all, but we don't. So from our perspective, it's a risk. Everything they're doing in Acts has never been done before. Sermons never been preached for the church before. 
Peter's stepping up to preach it. And it's not like it was an audience going, we'd love to have a Bible study. Can you just come teach us the Bible? They just killed Jesus seven weeks earlier. These very people that one day are chanting, Hosanna in the highest, are then chanting, crucify him. And Peter, as they're mocking him, steps up and goes, hold up. This has been talked about from a long time ago. Joel, David, and you killed him. That's supernatural. Huh. What risk does God want you to take? Because when we risk for God, then oftentimes what he'll do is supernatural work through that risk. He's doing some supernatural, amazing things just in this passage. In Acts chapter 2, remember, they're speaking. There's 120 of them. There's people gathered from all over, Cretans and Arabs and Parthenians and Medes and Persians, all these different people gathered together, and they're Galileans speaking their language, the truth of the gospel in a way that they can understand. It's a reversal of what happened in Genesis because in Genesis, remember, things got really bad. People only wanted to do evil all the time, and God in his wrath flooded the earth. But by his grace, preserved a family. That's Genesis chapter 6. By Genesis chapter 11, the whole world speaks the same language. But they want to build something for themselves for their own glory. It says this, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. So that we may make a name for ourselves, for their own glory. They want to steal God's glory. Otherwise, we'll be scattered. This is their fear. We'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So God brings judgment on them because he's angry that they're trying to do everything for their own glory, build their own kingdom and their own strength. And so he scatters them across the world and gives them different languages. It says it like this. God saying, come, here's the Trinity, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them, the very thing they were afraid of, from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city, and that is why it was called Babel, the Tower of Babel. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school and you just heard that story, you might not have known that it then ties, it's being reversed in Acts chapter 2, it's reversing the curse. Now, there's people gathered from all over the world. They're scattered. They're coming together for this Jewish festival, celebration. And these 120 guys get up and they're speaking languages, reversing the curse. Mount Sinai, the first Passover, when they parted the Red Sea. Seven weeks later, hmm, seven weeks after the Passover, Acts chapter 2, seven weeks later, Mount Sinai. You know what happens on Mount Sinai? Wind fire, God's presence. But remember uh, when Moses comes down, chapter 32, all the people are committing adultery and idolatry and debauchery. And he's angry. He throws the tablets down. And then God's judgment comes. Moses says, if you want to follow God with me, come over here. You don't have to, but if you want to come with me, only the Levites are identified as coming over there with him. Then Moses says, Exodus 32, I think we have the verses, there's 30, 27, 28. Um, the Levites had a sword on their hip, and he told them to run up and down and start killing all these people. These are their friends. These are the people they were with before. 3,000 people died that day. Acts chapter 2, seven weeks after they killed Jesus at the Passover, the day of Pentecost, therefore let all Israel be assured of this, verse 36. God's made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Turn, repent, be immersed, baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and all who are far off, that's us, and all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he pleaded, he warned them, he probably begged them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About how many? 3,000. So now there's life. Mm. So he takes when we take supernatural risk and he reverses curses and brings change, life. There's vision. 3,000 people baptized that day? Peter didn't baptize all of them. 
120 did, and they probably were probably divided up. Like, all right, now that I baptize you, who are you, who did you lead? Did you baptize them? And so maybe your vision for your future is you baptizing somebody that you love and know that needs Jesus. Maybe it's the reverse of a direction the way a marriage is going. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's a, I don't know, what curses does God want to reverse? You see, supernatural risk is empowered. You've got to take a step of faith. Supernatural guidance? I'll just ask you this. How did you get where you are in your life? Not just sitting in this room or watching online, but your career, your relationships, your wherever you're at. If you can explain it without the Holy Spirit, is it natural or supernatural? They told you it's possible to build a church naturally. The first service says some friends here that knew me, you know, 20 some years ago and lived in Dallas. And before I was going to be a church pastor, I was a reasonably successful salesperson. I would win a bunch of sales awards. And my boss called, the president of the company called one time and goes, what, How are you selling so many houses? And I said, Well, uh, people come in and I tell them about Jesus. They don't want to know about Jesus. I try to sell them a house. So the ladies across the street, they're better looking than me. They got a better house than me, but they never ask people to buy stuff. So and they just send them over here. I just go, do you want to buy this? And they buy it. It's crazy. I said, I'm honest. I tell them the truth. Like I tell them this isn't the best house there ever was. It's not the cheapest house there ever was. It might be the right fit for you. Let's figure it out. And if they don't want to do that, I stop wasting my time with them. They can go look at curtains all day long and I will go study my Bible. Uh, but there's something supernatural about it. Like, that's just like reading people, being honest. How'd you get to where you're at? God gave you some gifts, but not necessarily supernaturally empowered because you're using them. Maybe you're good at math or you're good at whatever it is that you do. And so, did you need the Holy Spirit for that? Because the Holy Spirit wants to guide us. If we had time, we'd walk through examples. I'd take you to Acts chapter 8, Philip. There's this eunuch, and God tells him to go walking down this desert street, and then to go up to this chariot, and there's a guy reading the Bible, but doesn't know what it means, and he explains it, and then the guy's like, can I get baptized? There's water. Why not get baptized? And we were like making people do 900 classes, but anyway, this guy um, baptizes them and leads them. Have you ever been led like that? I saw those friends in the first service from Dallas. It reminded me of a time. Well, oftentimes in the summer, we'll have a guy named Jarrett Stevens come and preach. He's a pastor of a, a church in Houston. Some of you have heard him before. I see some of your heads nodding. And um, He did a devotional for the church that I was at. Uh, the church had hundreds of people on staff. And so he came, and he was talking about listening to God. And after it was done, I'm a seminary student. I have tons of money. Uh, I like to buy food in quantity at that time rather than quality. And so I went to Taco Bell. This is pre-inflation right now, by the way. So you can buy like 9,000 tacos for a dollar. And uh, I, was at the, I was inside. They actually let me come inside. So I was inside. I didn't have to like order through some app. At any rate, weird stuff going on at Taco Bell now, other than blue soda. But at any rate, um, I ordered way more food than I needed. And I actually thought it as soon as I ordered it. I was like, why did I order it? It's like, I'll take one of the, oh, that sounds good. It'll be $4. Okay, there you go. Like, what am I going to do with this pizza? Now, what is it even? <laughs> and so I got this bag of food. I'm walking out. I'm into the parking lot, and I see out of the peripheral vision uh, this guy that's sitting there, and I hear God say, go give him your food. I'm like, that's weird. I'm not doing that. But he just said, like, listen to God. I'm like, but I don't usually hear him speak. Like, what in the world's happening? The guy's in, I'm like reasoning with God. He's in a restaurant. He doesn't need my food. So then I kind of like slow, slow, kind of obedient step. I'll just go inside, all right? I'll just go back inside. I go back inside. Then I see the guy, and I'm like, well, he's kind of disheveled. It looks like he might be homeless. I was like, I'm not going to go talk to him because that's weird, but I'll walk by him. <laughs> walk by him. And I see, when I get to the table, you, I didn't do anything special. You'd have done what I did because the guy said he's eating hot sauce packets. Homeless guy. And I just said, hey, man, I bought way too much food. Can I just give it to you? God directed, the Holy Spirit directed in that. But how many times do I not hear him? See, the reality is I think there's a lot of lost Christians. Lost, found people. Isn't that kind of funny? <laughs> I went to visit a friend in the hospital the other day. Is at the hospital my wife works at, Big Wake, over on New Bern Avenue. And typical procedure as a pastor, you walk up to the dentist, here's what I'm looking for, here I go, where do I go? And I thought I want to see my wife that day too. And so I decided I was going to see her, but she was in a special conference. And I had to find this place I'd never heard of. And I asked the lady, hey, how do I get to Andrews Hall? I think it was called Andrews Conference Center. And they tell me, I'm thinking, ah, yeah, yeah, give me the map. Whatever, I've been here before. I'll figure it out. I know where the cafeteria and elevators are, so that'll center me. <laughs> I thought I'd be there for 20 minutes. Two hours later, 
I'm in the PT department, physical therapy. I'm like, I didn't know they had a gym here. There's a gym. Anyway, and I see this guy, and I thought to myself, well, even if I get, I mean, there's only four corners, right? And so if I, fourth try, I'm going to find, no, there's more than four corners in this hospital, FYI. So I'm in the PT area, and I walk up to this guy, and I said, hey, I'm looking for the, I could sense, like I thought, it's just around the corner. I know it's like, I just got to see the name on the door, Andrews Hall. And then I, I, I got to be close. I go to this guy. I said, excuse me, sir, you know where Andrews Hall is? And he looked just like Ben Affleck in this picture when I said that. Oh. <laughs> he seriously went, whew, like how am I going to tell you how to get there? He goes, all right. So you go back to the main hospital. I was like, whoa, I left the hospital? And how did this happen? Give me these directions. I got to this area, and then, some, and then a person walked me to where I would have never found. I wasn't even on the right floor. This person walked me to the Holy Spirit. They're supposed to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh, Galatians chapter 5. It's a metaphor. A walk in the Bible is a metaphor for the Christian journey. The Holy Spirit is a guide. How did you get where you are? Natural or supernatural? Supernatural guidance, if you want to be where God wants you. Some of us are trying to figure out God's plan for our lives. Here's an interesting verse for you. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. The Holy Spirit tells them not to go preach to people who needed to hear about Jesus. Whoa! Because I would have just discerned, like, well, I guess I should go preach, and the Bible says go make disciples, and I'm going to go here because they don't know. Holy Spirit, don't do that! There's something else. Ooh, we've got to listen listening, guided. There's a supernatural boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. I don't think I have to spend much time talking about that. You see what, the, what is said. Read Acts chapter 4, and, and they pray. There's an interesting encounter where the leaders are saying, stop talking about Jesus, and they say, we got to talk about what we've seen and heard. That's a witness, by the way. Um, and they say, yeah, don't do that. And say, well, we're still going to do that. Uh, we're going to flog you and beat you and throw you in prison. Okay, but well, we're still going to do it. They leave. <laughs> it's funny. And then they go to their friends and say, let's pray. And they pray, and the place is shaken. Whoa. Been to that prayer meeting? The bold prayers, not just rote prayers, bold prayers, bold witness. Supernatural holiness. Uh, we see here this fire that's on them, fire in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a symbol of purification of God's presence, which is required for purification. Um, the Holy Spirit sets us free. Read Acts. What's the being set free from prison, Acts 12. Well, there it's the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip shares the gospel with in Acts chapter 8, or the Philippian jailer that the prison doors are thrown open, and instead of leaving to go be free, they set the jailer, the one that was holding them captive, free spiritually as they tell them how to be saved. And some of you are fighting sin in this battle. And I mean, non-believers can quit smoking, stop looking at porn, tactics. The Holy Spirit can give you new desire, which leads us to the last part. It can give you supernatural courage and supernatural risk, supernatural guidance, supernatural holiness, and the thing we're all looking for, believe it or not, supernatural happiness. Acts chapter 13, verses 50 through 52. I won't read it. You might put it up on the screen just so people who don't want to hear my voice anymore can read it. Um, what happens is they're being persecuted and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and joy. It's a supernatural happiness that regardless of what's happening around, they experience. And so the evidence of the Holy Spirit in you is that you're sensitive to other people's needs. Your, your desires change, that you're not trying to build your own kingdom, that you would sacrifice your own best interest for the sake of other people's best interest, that you, that you would be willing to wait when waiting is appropriate that you experience happiness regardless of circumstances, that in the midst of chaos, you can be calm. The Bible says it like this. It calls it a fruit. In Galatians chapter 5, I told you verse 16 says to walk in the Spirit. Verse 19 talks about what it is when we walk not supernaturally but naturally. It says the acts that are natural of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, the word for witchcraft is pharmacia, drug use, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, that kind of stuff. You get the idea. It's not an exhaustive list. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, but that's natural. Here's what's supernatural. The fruit, 
not plural. Here's the evidences of this one thing being true in you, that the Spirit of God is indwelling you, that you're being filled, that you are walking with love. Oh, by the way, that's a desire to lay down your best interest for somebody else's. Joy, deep felt, untouchable happiness. Peace, that's a calmness amidst chaos. I just use different words. Forbearance, ability to wait when waiting is appropriate. Kindness, goodness. How about this? Uh, faithfulness, a lot of small steps in the same direction over a long period of time. Gentleness, a responsiveness to other people's needs. Self-control, mm. who can control even the tongue? Supernatural happiness when the Spirit's in control of your life. When you walk in the Spirit. Are you walking in the Spirit? Here's the great news. If you're not, you can get back and step right now. My wife and I used to run together, and her dad was in the army, and neither one of us were in the army, but he taught her when she was a little girl chants that they would say. Because think about a, a, an army platoon all running together at the same pace. My wife and I don't run the same pace. She's steady, and I, it's like I live my life. I'm like going fast, then walking. Going fast, then walking. We're supposed to run together. How do we do that? So she taught me some of the, the chants. He was an airborne ranger. R is for ranger. A is for all the way. Don't do nothing. N is for never quit. And as we were saying it, we run in the same step. But if you get out of step, you don't wait till the next day. God's mercies are new every morning, Pastor. Yeah, but you can get in step right now. Get back in step during this march, right now on this mission and what he has for you now. You don't have to wait. The time is now. So let's pray. Bow our heads and close our eyes. And Some of you might be like the listeners in Acts 2 that were some curious and some judgmental about Jesus. And, and I say to you what Peter said to them, you killed him. It was your sin that nailed him to the cross. Maybe you hear that and the Holy Spirit convicts, it convicts the whole world, John chapter 16, of our sins. Maybe you're feeling convicted of your sin. But before you run to shame and guilt and hide and don't want anyone to know, what if you confess that sin to the one who already knows, Jesus, who is the Savior of the world, the Lord, the Christ, and you ask Him to be your Savior, your Lord, and your Christ, the Bible says that you will be forgiven, and that the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5, will wash you of your sins and cleanse you and give you, like these 3,000 people experience, new life right now, online, in this room, if you need that, talk to Him right now, but there's probably hundreds of conversations going on, there's other things, maybe you need to be set free, maybe you've been out of step with the Spirit, and you need to, like running in a, a platoon, get back in step, Right now, walk in the Spirit. Maybe you're like Peter, one moment doing great, next moment not doing well, get back. It's a battle. As for the supernatural empowering, searching God's will for your life, why would you do that without the Holy Spirit? Need healing, freedom from a sin that's caught you or bound you, or maybe it's secret and no one can even see it. It's the way you think about others or something else that's happened. What's the vision? He wants to give you as he guides you in the future. The face, the person he wants you to baptize, the relationship to be reconciled, the forgiveness that needs to happen, the healing from your own hurt. Father, will you please move and work in ways beyond what I could ever ask or imagine. Show us the height, the depth, the length, the width of your love. Help us to be filled with the fullness of you, your Holy Spirit. Control us, guide us. Move us so that our lives can only be explained, this church can only be explained by your supernatural work. I pray that we'd be a supernatural, unstoppable, not just that we never close the doors, but that you are moving and working. Movement of yours. Help us to enjoy you through your spirit. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thanks for listening to sermons from Southbridge Fellowship in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you have a question about the message you just heard, email us at info at sfchurch.com. For additional resources or service information, visit us at sfchurch.com.